Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. Remember, this is uh, leading up to the great chapter 11, which is all about faith. And the writer, since we began, has been encouraging Jewish converts to the faith to avoid apostasy. He's been talking about apostasy is possible for believers. Over and over, he talks about it. And last week we read in verse 26 where he said, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. And I think we covered that this could and would not mean uh, what we, we, when it means to sin willfully, we talked about what it means relative to what John and and Paul and, and Ringo, excuse me, Peter, excuse me, said, uh, a little joke for you. Uh, see if you're awake and you're not. Uh, so uh, we read in verse 26 that he says, if you sin willfully, if you fall from the faith is how it was interpreted. We are all going to commit sin. That's part of our flesh nature. But if you sin willfully because the commandment under the Christian uh, generation, the, the Christian period, the Christian dispensation is to walk by faith. If you stop walking by faith willfully, there will be no more uh, uh, sacrifice for sin. But he says in verse 27, our text for today, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He goes on, he says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite the spirit of grace? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. He ends with, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Again, the context, these Jewish converts had, were uh, thinking of going back to the law. They were tempted to go back to Judaism. They were tempted to abandon the faith. And he is telling them, don't do this, all right? So again, verse 26, the writer again says, for if we sin willfully, which we interpreted it is, for if we willingly walk from faith once and for all, he goes on, after we have received a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. We noted that the writer is clearly speaking to believers. This is an audience of believers. He, if, and he's telling them this, uh, that they have, he says, who have received a knowledge of the truth. They have received it. They've got it. And he says, if you walk from that, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. What does remain? We have to ask at this point. What does remain? He says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That is, a, that is like a, a terrifying verse for us who are under grace. Don't misapply it. Don't think that we should be fearfully looking for fire and judgment uh, because we have fallen into sin or we are in sin in our flesh, uh, but we are of faith and struggling. That's not what it means. When we read in that verse, but a certain fearful looking, in English, when we talk about the word certain, we believe that it's saying, this is what is certainly, it is certain, meaning um, inevitable. But the, I don't think that's what it means here. There are different, different opinions on this word, and uh, most translations keep the English word certain in place. But I think when we look at the Greek, the word is translated certain from tis, a T-I-S in the Greek, and it better reflects, paradoxically, it reflects apprehension. So read it this way. But a certain fearful looking, there's an apprehension of fearful uh, expectation. And I know the word certain doesn't seem to lend to it. In other words, certain here seems to mean that the writer's saying something like, um, 
it would be like this. We might say, there's a certain feeling in the air I can't describe. It doesn't mean there is a specific, this is the, there's this, this certain, that's how the word certain is being used there. Not a deliberate, this is it, but kind of a, uh, so it's like there's a certain feeling in the air he's using rather than if you drive fast on this road, you will certainly crash. There's a difference in our use of the word certain, and the former is what I think he's saying. In any case, the writer says that if a person walks from faith once and for all, there remains a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation. That can be expected. Now he's talking to believers. In other words, you can expect nothing other than judgment to come. The gospel is the only hope. Reject it, walk away from it, and that's what it, that's the, that's what it means here, rejecting it, not up and down of faith, not falling into some sin, coming back, and all of that stuff. It's turning from God and saying, forget you, reject it, and there is a very unpleasant judgment, fiery indignation waiting for you, the writer tells these believers who were once Jews. In addition to this expectful, fearful judgment, he says, fiery indicate indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Others' translations say it this way, but a, a gr only a great fear of being judged remains and a fire of wrath which will be the destruction of the haters of God. So this would mean that somebody who is walking has turned into a hater of God. Not somebody who's wondering about God or struggling. It's someone who's a hater of God. And there are people who, Billy Graham had a right-hand man who uh, walked with him for years in the faith, and he turned. He turned hardcore atheist against God. This is who he's speaking of. Don't go back. Uh, the revised version says, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. The Young's Living, which I always like, says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery zeal about to devour the opposers. Now, we can and should read this passage and its warning in two distinct ways. Here the writer is talking to the Jews at that time, thinking of going back to uh, Judaism. So first, what he's telling them has an immediate physical application, okay, to them. And then there's a second application in a spiritual sense, all right? So what's this physical application he's warning them about? Look, at if you go back into apostasy as Jews who have converted, Beware, because there is judgment and a fiery thing waiting you. And what does that mean in the physical sense to them? The writer told them in verse 25, Don't forsake assembling yourselves together, as some have done, but exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, He's warning them about a specific day that's coming in their lives. The book of Hebrews, they think, was written about 65, 66, 67 A.D. And he's telling them, don't go back into apostasy. Something's coming your way. The day is approaching. And if you do, judgment and a fiery wrath is going to fall upon you. All right? So in this sense, he's warning them about the oncoming destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D. and where the Romans came in and it was consumed really by warfare and fire. For the Jews and the apostolic church of that day, Jesus promised his return. To apostatize from the faith, which would be to sin willfully, would amount to nothing but destruction upon that return, which Jesus said would be within this generation in Matthew 24. We know that this is the contextual case because the Greek, where the writer says, uh, shall is about to, it means really, really soon. The word is mellow. You can check this yourselves. M-E-L-L-O. That's what is used here. It says, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and firing indication, indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. The Greek word for which shall means very, very, very soon. It's going to happen. Mellow. Okay. It's going to come and devour those who have rejected Christ. And it did within a couple years. Okay, so I would suggest that this could only be the prophetic reference to the fact that all the signs were there for the writer of Hebrews 
of the imminent destruction of Jerusalem, which again, Jesus tied directly to his return in Matthew 24. And if they were to have walked from the faith as Christians who were saved at that time, they would have been part of the physical destruction of Jerusalem. By the way, just to let you know, if you want to know another really interesting place where mellow shall about immediately is going to happen, I'm going to give you a couple. If you uh, look in Revelation chapter 1, the very first chapter, this is the context of that book. The writer uh, says, Jesus, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he says, it's God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which, which must shortly come to pass. That's mellow. It's coming quickly. In verse 3 of the uh, first chapter of Revelation, it says, for the time is at hand. And then, and then it goes down and it says, he cometh, behold, he cometh in verse seven. He is talking to the saints at that time. Now, if you go to the very last chapter of uh, Revelation, we see the same thing. Listen, it says in chapter 22 of Revelation, the last chapter of the book, these things must shortly be done. That's mellow. It's going to happen any time. All right. And if you drop down to verse 10, for the time is at hand, it says in the last chapter. Uh, and, then he, and then in verse 12, it says, and behold, I come quickly. That is shortly, shortly, that's mellow. I'm coming. It doesn't mean I'm coming in 2,000 years and this destruction and all this is going to happen. It means I'm coming now. And then he ends the second to the last verse of the entire book of Revelation. It says, he which testified the things said, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus, writes John. And that surely I come quickly means it's coming right now. Well, this is the same word that the writer of Hebrews is using to these guys who are thinking of leaving the faith. Don't go back to Judaism. He's about to be here. I know you've suffered, he's saying, but don't let that suffering lead you back, okay? In Matthew 23, after thoroughly thrashing the Pharisees, Jesus says, you serpents, you generations of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's how the King James translates it. So he's talking to them in the Temple Mount, and he says, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's the translation there. In the Greek, what he really said, and, and a Greek scholar will agree with this, oh, you generations of vipers, how can you escape the judgment of Gehenna? The King James translates it to the damnation of hell. We think it's talking about a place after this life down below the earth. That's not what he said. He said to those Pharisees up on the Temple Mount, you guys, how are you going to escape the judgment of Gehenna? What is that? Um, that, that passage makes the phrase spiritual and futur uh, futuristic. Um, The damnation of hell is futuristic, and you would read it that way, but the judgment of Gehenna is about to happen, and that's what Christ was saying in Matthew 24. Now, many Christians today have taken this line and suggested that Jesus was talking about the Pharisees and those who are like Pharisees, etc., going to hell. I would strongly suggest that what Jesus said was exactly what he meant there. When he said to the Pharisees, how can you escape the judgment of Gehenna, he was talking about the judgment of Gehenna. What was that judgment? In Jerusalem, there's a place called Gehenna. It's also known as the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. And it's a steep, narrow glen to the south of Jerusalem. And anciently, the Jews, when they were idolatrous, took their children and sacrificed them to Moloch in the Valley of Hinnom at Gehenna, okay? Because they fell into such apostasy, it became known as a picture of a horrible place. And the Jews literally physically took their trash there. They took their dead bodies there. They took the, the uh, parts of dead animals there. The Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, was a terrible place. And because all that, that ugly, stinking refuse was put there, they burned it. That's where they lit it on fire. And so it was a literal place, Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom at the south end of Jerusalem in a little valley. And Jesus says to these Pharisees, how are you going to escape the judgment of that literal place? That's what it means. King James changed it to the uh, uh, damnation of hell, but it means that literal place of, of Hinnom. Well, what happened is um, 
He was literally, Jesus was describing a literal place where the bodies of thousands of Jews would be cast into, over the walls, into that valley at the destruction of Jerusalem. Burned up with fire. Josephus reports that that place was full of dead Jews. And so when Jesus said to them, how are you going to escape this judgment of Gehenna? He was talking about a literal place right there that he was saying, you're going to get cast in there. You know, now we have said he was talking about a future place. Well, he may have been too. We don't, we're not sure on that yet, but I'm just talking about what he literally was talking about. And that's the physical destruction that this writer of Hebrews is warning them against. Go back to the old faith. You are going to experience judgment and a fiery indignation, which is shortly coming, you guys, okay? The second application has to do with the place after this life where fire consumes Mars causes people to suffer loss. That's what the suffering is. It's the suffering of loss. Biblically, this has never been hell. I know we have always likened the two. When you die, you go to the burning place. Our cartoons, guys, Goofy's walking around. He gets hit by a train. His brother goes to heaven where there's angels. And Goofy goes down to where the devil's standing and there's flames. That is not how hell is described in scripture. The lake of fire is described that way, but hell is not. Fire is often used in scripture as an emblem of purification, refinement, uh, uh, punishment. Yes, it destroys people who are subject to it, suffer loss. In the case of the Hebrew converts, the writer plainly tells them, cling to faith. To do otherwise would expose them first to the judgment of Gehenna, to where there's judgment poured out by the Romans upon them physically, and to fiery indignation, which was quickly coming upon them. The message is then spiritually applicable to believers today. Now we read it in the spiritual sense. Does it mean we are going to actually be cast in Gehenna and face judgment? No, but we will have our own judgment and we will have our own fiery indignation if we don't maintain in faith. That's all it's saying. That's how we read it spiritually. So I would suggest that since the nation of Israel was materially based, everything they did, you do this, you receive that, you do that, you receive this. They had the material Messiah come to them. They, he actually came to them physically. He resurrected physically. All of it was material and physical with them. I, I would suggest that judgment was clearly physical for the nation at 70 AD. I would also suggest as non-Jews who now walk by faith, us, the events described are played out for us spiritually, okay? And our future individuals. So the writer could be saying to us, don't go back on your faith. Don't let go of your faith because what waits you is judgment and a fiery indignation. Just as he said it to the Jews physically, he means to us spiritually. For the Jews in the apostolic church, waiting Christ's immediate return, the reward was the fact that they were saved from judgment. Gehenna. They were saved by, uh, uh, in the destruction of Jerusalem, the loss of fire by the rapture of the apostolic church, I believe. You may not. Every Gentile convert today who abides in faith will be individually and spiritually raptured at the time of their death. They will escape judgment and they will go straight to God with a resurrected spiritual body. That's how I see it. I, it's a preterist view. That's what it's called, a preterist view. A lot don't have that. Those who die without saving faith today or those who have believed and let go of faith and went and returned to their former lives will individually experience judgment, bypass spiritual uh, resurrection that will come later, go to Sheol, the same picture for Gehenna, now go to a real spiritual waiting place, wait there in the absence of light, the absence of God, it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, that I could have done this. Oh, that I should have done that. Be let out, according to Revelation, brought forth, stand before the great white throne judgment, be judged according to their works. And it says the books are open and another book is open. And they look to see if their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, they don't go to the lake of fire. They are, they are saved from that second death, which is what Christ called it. They go into heaven, okay? The writer continues with an, uh, an illustration to support his warnings. 
of, to these guys about escaping the physical punishment. And he goes back to the Old Testament, uh, which he's fond of doing, as you know, if you've been with us. And he says, verse 28, look at those people that despised Moses law back in the day died without mercy under the hand of two or three witnesses. That was the law. Two or three witnesses says he's guilty. They were put to death. They died, he said, without mercy. There was no provision for their pardon for those who died without mercy. Then he makes the point saying all this to these converts, to the Christian faith who are listening and reading his thing. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy of who has trodden under the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, okay, an unholy thing, and he's done it despite the spirit of grace that has been given him, okay? How, how much sore the punishment. Now, don't take this wrong. This isn't an appeal to mortifying the flesh and becoming perfect in the flesh. It never has been. It's about walking in the spirit, trusting and believing. But these Jews here were, who were converts were thinking of going back to the law, and he's saying, look it. Don't do that. Under the law, there was a punishment for apostasy or rebelliousness. And if a person was guilty under the law by that witnesses, they were put to death. There was no put to death. There was no system of mercy available to them. Then looking at believers, regenerated believers in Christ, he says, of how much sorer the punishment do you suppose? How much worse do you think the punishment will be for those uh, how much more worthy, he says, shall they be thought worthy? How much more worthy of a sore punishment will they be for those who have one, trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant where he was sanctified an unholy thing. So that is loss of faith. You notice this is how he's defining it. It's a loss of faith. Jesus' blood doesn't do anything for me. I don't care about the, what Jesus has done. It's a loss of faith and has done this despite the spirit of grace, okay? We are talking about a true apostate here, okay? In other words, a person who renounces Christianity ought to be regarded as deserving a much severer punishment than the man who apostatized from the Jewish faith. Why? The Jewish religion was founded on inferior elements, but Christianity was founded on the life and shed blood of God's only son, so, of course, the punishment is going to be far more severe for somebody who once embraced by faith and received the spirit of grace and walked in the spirit of grace and then goes back and says, no, that's not enough. You know, it, he's not the only thing. How much sore of a punishment are you who have trampled under a uh, foot the uh, son of God, he says. If this is so, to receive him and then reject him, who is always something better in, in Hebrews, he is something better, this automatically means the punishment is going to be worse, okay? To have rebelled against the law means, oh, you just rebelled against the system that was in place, which was inferior to begin with, really. The law was perfect, actually, but we are inferior, so we couldn't do it. So, but if you have rebelled against the law, you're gonna bear one type of punishment. It was the physical punishment, okay? But to have experienced Jesus in grace, he freely gives and reject him would bear a punishment much more severe. And again, since he is speaking with Jews, he once again cites scripture that they were probably familiar with. And he lets them reiterate this point by saying, verse 30, for we know him, God, who has said, vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, he gives another one. The Lord shall judge his people. Paul says in his scripture, it's lost, in my opinion, in today's Christianity. We will, he almost says like, don't kid yourselves. You reap what you sow. Don't kid yourselves. Okay. It's not that um, there is a law of the harvest, it, 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 but it applies in a spiritual sense to our growth in Christ. And it applies to how we have died to our flesh and lived to our faith. So that is how he means that. But still, there is a law of the harvest. For we know him, the writer says, referring to God who uttered scripture. For we know him, vengeance. He said, vengeance belongs to me. I will rec uh, recompense. That's found in Deuteronomy 32, 35. And it means leave the vengeance of, of reprobate souls up to the only one who knows all the facts. But he does know all the facts about the apostate heart. 
he, and, and he will have his uh, vengeance. To quote this passage at this point clearly infers that those who walk from faith in his son will experience vengeance of the Lord. Then the writer adds another passage. This one's taken from Deuteronomy 32 as well, verse 36, I think. And it says again. So he gives another passage that these Jews would understand. The Lord shall judge his people. Okay. This is quoted from the very next passage in that chapter in Deuteronomy, and it echoes the very same sentiments. He will judge and he will exact vengeance. The writer concludes his admonition here with this line. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, period. A fearful thing. Now, in our day and age, we talk a lot about loving God, the loving God, the God of grace. Absolutely praise God. No one loves greater. No one loves more. The Father is a Father of love. We are secure in Him. He sent His Son. Just look to His Son. Let His Son, and so I am not discounting the loving God, but you have a choice really in life. You can pursue the loving God through His Son, or you can inadvertently pursue the living God without his son, and, I, and I'm not saying the loving God isn't living, and I'm not saying the living God isn't loving, but you want him to be living for, loving first and then living. Because here the writer says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This could have been taken, borrowed. The writer is quoting from the Old Testament. Twice he's done it now in this. He could be pulling from a line that David used. Let me tell you the story really quickly. King David, First Chronicles. Uh, it says in the first chapter, oh, what chapter do I have it? Chapter 21. It says in the very first verse that, day, that it says, Satan, uh, what does it say? Moved against Israel and had David count them. Okay. Now, for some reason, David just decides, you know, I wonder how powerful we are in the flesh. Maybe it was pride. Boy, it'd be great to see how strong we are as a nation. Whatever it was, the writer says Satan moved against Israel for David to do this. And David ordered that they go out and count how many warriors and men they have on Israel's side. Well, this ticked God off to no end. No end. All right. We read in verse 7, and God was displeased with this thing. Maybe it was the pride in David's heart. Who knows? Therefore he smote Israel, and David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. By the way, when one person sinned within, the, uh, uh, within Israel, it was as if the whole group sinned. And when, when you break one law of the, of the law, you've broken the whole thing, as we know from James. So when one person sinned, the whole nation was, this is why David made the mistake, but everybody's paying for it, okay? And, and David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I've done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Well, we didn't have an atonement there for David to, he could have sacrificed animals and stuff, but there was going to be a payment. And the Lord God said to Gad, David's seer, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, David. Choose thee one of them that I may do it unto you. David's the king. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, choose three, either three years famine, three months to be destroyed before your enemies, while the swords of your enemies overtake you, or else three days the sword of the Lord. You want your enemies chasing you with their swords for three months, or you want three days of the sword of the Lord. Okay? Okay. And the angel of the Lord destroying throughout the coast of all Israel, Gad tells David. So now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring to him that sent me, Gad says. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait, trouble, problem, fixed, confined area. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. This is where we think that the writer of Hebrews is pulling from. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. We think that he's pulling from here. This, he's, David says, let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. 
but let me not fall into the hand of man. Okay, so there's the setup. David acting on faith and knowing that men are capable of doing horrible things, but God is a merciful God and God loves him. And David is a man after God's heart. He says, let me fall into the hand of the Lord for greater his mercies, but don't let me fall into the hand of man. Maybe the writer was thinking of this when he says, it's a fearful thing now to fall into the hand of the Lord. As we read the story of David, we discover what the result was of David's choice. In verse 14, it says, and the Lord being merciful and kind took his four souls each of them being gray in the crown and with a foot stepping on the edge of the grave. The merciful, loving God, all he did was take four men who were ready to die. That's not true. I just lied to you. I just made up my own scripture. I just, I, I just made up something that kind of goes along with how we think today. You know, yeah, yeah, I've been saved by Jesus' blood. Well, I don't really know. I can do my own work, so I think I'll perfect myself. Whatever it is, I just made light of it by convening that. No, no, actually... David said, I don't want to pick. I'll leave it in the hand of the Lord because he's merciful. And it says in verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel and there fell in Israel 70,000 men. 70,000 people the Lord slew there. Because David counted how many were in Israel. 70,000. Truly, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I think the writer of Hebrews is pulling to that story to let them know, yes, hey, be falling down praising God that you are covered in the blood of his, of his son and don't go back to that former way because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right, and this story proves it. The question remains, is this still the case with us today? Well, the writer of Hebrews who wrote after the advent of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension intimates that, no, it's not the case. It's worse. He's telling us it's worse now, not better. The living God hasn't become more lenient because of the shed blood of his son that's discounted and trampled underfoot, he's become more angry. That's why he says, have how much sore a punishment awaits. They, under Moses, two or three witnesses, you died without mercy. But now, this is, that's the point. For those who are not, specifically those who have a faith, that's what he's talking about. The writer says it's worse because his reasoning seems to say those who once knew God's only begotten son have turned on him, have trodden underfoot the son of God, have counted the blood of the covenant unholy despite of the spirit of grace that they have been given. The darn thing of running around and saying once saved, always saved, it's impossible to turn. It's not true. It is not true. And it has done so much disservice to people who, if they knew otherwise, would say, I ought to be a little bit more conscious of what God wants from me in my life rather than one I'm saying. Now, listen, mature Christians who believe once saved, always saved, they're great because they've learned to walk by faith and trust and they grow and they produce fruits of love. But immature Christians who hear that, the writer here is intimating very strongly that you can apostatize. And we have done a great service in suggesting otherwise. The idea here, as much as it's not taught or addressed in this day and age very much, or is overstressed, that's the other thing. We go from don't worry about it to you've got to keep yourself saved through your righteousness. Do this, do that through your flesh. That's just as bad. That's what the writer is warning these Jews about. They weren't saying we want to go out into the world and sin. They're saying we want to go back to the law and become righteous through the law. And he's saying, that is such a bad decision. That's trampling Jesus underfoot. So it's not going back to law and being perfected in the flesh, nor is it carna carnal Christianity. Uh, it's not sinless life. That's impossible. It is the heart of faith. Faith. Remember, I just said before we started, we're getting ready to go into Hebrews chapter 11, all about faith. And so it's the faith that he is saying, you've got to hang on there. It would be utterly horrific if you didn't. So, his love was so great. He sent his only begotten son, whose yoke is light, to have received the son and rejected him. No bueno. No offense, Phyllis, whose last name is Bueno. Uh, not good. Do not do this. 
Now, I must admit, after years, literally years and years of it being in the Word, no different than you, my views of God and His relationship with, with man have become really polarized. Uh, uh, you would think they'd become more centrific and I would be more balanced. Actually, I be, have become more polarized in my Christian faith. And what I mean by this is we cannot, as we try to stress over and over, fathom the love and grace that have come from God, the characteristics that he pours out upon us because we have received his son and his sacrifice. I has not uh, heard, uh, I has not heard, ear has not seen, uh, the glories that await those who love him. It is a gift. It's there. We can't overemphasize that. And on the polarized end of that, I am so sold out. Nevertheless, to trod underfoot the blood of the Son of God, to reject it out of hand, and um, altogether must, in my opinion, be met with incomprehensible fire. That's it. I'm not making this stuff up. The writer of Hebrews is telling us. The writer of Scripture is the one who says it. And while I believe mercy will, in the end, triumph over justice, as James says, and that is... There was a limit to the number of Israelites that God killed with David. Remember, he killed 70,000. There was a limit to what he was doing. There was something that he did, but there was a limit to it. He didn't kill all but one or something, or he didn't kill all. Nevertheless, um, nobody would ever, ever want to experience a taste of the dark hell, ever. Especially if you have tasted and been illuminated by his grace. And then especially you would never want to lose your soul in the lake of fire. Uh, this would be falling into the hands of the living God rather than into the hands of the altogether loving one. Now, some suggest the term living God gives us a definition of what punishment means in his hand. And what I mean by that is the term living God is opposed to dead gods. This morning we were talking about God with capital G versus God with a lowercase g, all theos. It's God is God. It's a title. The living God as opposed to dead gods or everything else is dead. But he is the living God because he's existed eternally and he never dies. And therefore his blessings and his punishments, some say, are eternal because he's the living God. And those punishments and blessings come out through him in an eternal way. So in other words, the idea, it is far more fearful to fall into the hands of the eternal hands of the living God than to an idolatrous God because his wrath doesn't end. I'm not sure I agree with this. It's certainly been taught, and it's been taught over the ages, that God is eternal, therefore his punishments are eternal. Uh, you've heard my arguments on this here, and so I'm not going to rearticulate them. All I will say is I do agree with Scripture that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And one final thought. This is getting a little deeper. The writer is speaking to converted Jews who believed, who were illuminated, who knew the spirit of grace and came to know the Lord of truth. He is warning them of the dangers and punishment for apostasy. His threat of punishment includes judgment and a fiery indignation. And because of this, I would suggest that true apostates make a trip to the place that was not created for them in the first place, a fiery lake of fire. If judgment awaits those who leave the faith and a fiery indignation, that's not going to happen to us necessarily in a destruction of Rome, but it will happen to those who have apostatized from the faith today, leaving Christ behind. Before we move on, I've wondered about something. Maybe you have too. Let's talk about it quickly. Think about it. Bring up questions. Let me sort of bring up my explanation, what I think scripture taken as a whole describes as the afterlife experience of all men since the destruction of Jerusalem. So let's break it into two categories. First, there are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's everybody in this room, everybody in this room. And I might be speaking hopefully, and I might be speaking actually, but I believe everybody in this room, true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's everybody else. Okay, just put it that way to make it simple. Said believers, I believe, I do believe. And the Lord says, I don't know who you are. Apostates, I believed at one time, but you're not. You know, and those who absolutely reject Jesus as the way, truth, and the life in this life. Okay, 
true believers and then everybody else. True believers who believed in him and loved God and men as a result die and go to heaven. Why did I put it that way? There are exceptions to this, thief on the cross, but I don't think we could ever call belief true if it does not at least include the desire to love God and our fellow man. Just the, at least the desire. We might fail, but true belief is always going to translate into love of God and man. False belief, this is words. That's all, that's all they are. But true belief always goes hand in hand with a desire and then success at loving God, if allowed to tarry, and to love man. So when we look at those who die and go to hell, who are then released to stand before the great white throne, and, and the Lamb's book of life is open to see if their names are included in it, we have to ask ourselves a question. Now, this is the one I I've always wondered about, and, and maybe you have too. Why? have some who have come out of hell's names, would they be written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Why on earth would the Lamb's Book of Life be opened up? The book was opened, another book was opened, and their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that if a man believes on him, he should never die, okay? Now, we know that is not speaking of spiritual death, because we've all died spiritually being born into this world because of Adam's fall. So the spiritual death is the first death. Uh, we know he doesn't refer to physical death when Jesus says in John, if you believe on me, you shall not die because we all die physically. So he's not talking about physical death there either. So what's he talking about when he says, if you believe on me, you shall not die. Um, I would suggest it's what Revelation calls the second death which occurs in the lake of fire, which was prepared not for man, but for Satan and his angels, okay? So we have hell giving up its dead. We have uh, th uh, the great white throne with judgment, Lamb's book of life, and then we have the lake of fire, which Revelation says is in the presence of God and his angels. So we have all that, got that kind of order here, okay? Hell gives up its dead. Some's names are written in heaven, but those whose names aren't go into the lake of fire, okay? And Revelation calls that the second death, Death of what? It's not the spirit. They were never spiritually regenerated. Or it's not the body. They will be, all will be resurrected according to scripture. What dies there? Jesus was asked a question, or actually Jesus made a comment when he walked the earth. Remember, he said, what does it profit a man, a woman, if they gain the whole world, but lose their soul? So the second death, the first death of spiritual death, the second death must be loss of soul. When God was in, uh, in, in Genesis, he breathed into the clay, his pneuma, his breath, and the clay became a living soul. So the, the, the breath at death goes back to God who gave it. The soul goes to hell and waits. The body goes to the grave. Those souls go and stand before the great white throne. Their names are either written in the book and they go to heaven or they are cast into the lake of fire and experience the second death, which would be the death of the soul. They've gained the whole world, partied it up, blah, blah, blah. And then they lose their mind, will, and emotion according to what this says. And they come back out, I would suggest... I believe in reconciliation. I, don't, I believe in a merciful God and a just God. I believe they come out blank slates. We don't recognize who they are. They have lost their mind, will, and emotion. They're not a person before God, as his sons and daughters are who go to him, who retain their mind, will, and emotion that have been developed by him, you see. So that is where the loss takes place in that lake of fire. Could it be that we could suggest, maybe safely suppose, that people who go to hell do not necessarily come out of it suffering the loss of soul? Could it be that their time in hell is to reflect and mourn over their failing Christian walk? This is really scary for people. This is terribly scary. Because what I'm suggesting is that people have been saved from the second death, but they go to hell after this life to reflect upon their carnal Christian living before entering into heaven because their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
that is possible according to what scripture says. This is refutation. We can talk about it. I could be very well be wrong. Um, I say this because according to scripture, it seems that some will come out of hell, stand before the great white throne. It will be discovered that their names are in fact written in the Lamb's book of life and they enter heaven. Again, those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life to experience hell and yet escape loss of the second death. That makes some sense to me. They haven't died as Christ said they would. Carnal Christians, apostates, believers overcome by their flesh, maybe so, I don't know. I realize that we have historically taught that to believe means to escape hell. We always use that. But to believe from Jesus' words mean believe on me and you will escape death. Hell is not death. The lake of fire is death, you see. I wonder, the more I read and contemplate the word, if this is true. Again, for clarity's sake, the place created for Satan and his angels is not hell. That is not hell. But the lake of fire, that is uh, uh, where the flames are for the destruction. Again, hell is not the place of burning flames. It's the lake of fire. Again, Jesus said those who believe on him will not see that second death. And the second death he was speaking of is described in Revelation as the lake of fire, not the hell. And then hell gives up its dead. And with all the inhabitants standing before the great white throne of God, again, at that time, we read that the books are open and some who are in hell's names are in that book of life. How could they get written in there if they didn't believe? There is no other way to get there but by Jesus Christ. There has to have been faith sometime on him. And so when we stand up and we say, disbelieve and don't worry about it. And you run into these guys and he, you know, whatever. I believed once, I was a Christian once, I talked to him all the time. And you're like, where is the fruit of love? You know, where is the growth? Where is the purpose in your life? Yes, it's a wonderful thing to come to saving faith. It is a gift of God. Yes, we are saved like the thief on the cross when we come to understand him. But by God, don't, don't fool yourself into thinking, hey, I can be fat, dumb, and happy now. The Holy Spirit is not calling us to do that. The Holy Spirit is calling us to become Christ, to die to our flesh, to walk in the Spirit, and to become Christ to our neighbors, joint heirs with him, if we suffer with him. The Christian who claims Christ and never suffers to be like him, I wonder. And I know, oh gosh, I could hear, if, if people were actually watching this, I know the lynch mob would come. But uh, you can't help but read scripture and see what it says. <sighs> Admittedly, it's a lot of hypothecation in between the lines. To dwell on such things is not the point. The writer is writing to guide his reader to better things, okay? The warning is not the focal point. The warning is, is a subtext to the joy. The warning is just, look, you guys are getting so far out there, I've gotta let you know this. But it's not something we focus on because that's not walking by faith, that's walking by fear. So don't get me wrong. But uh, alternative paths are not worthy. Typical of apostolic writers, when we go through and read their words, he continues after this stern warning of clinging to faith, to the shed blood of Christ, he continues now to start encouraging them, okay? So don't let all that bring you down and scare you. You're not on that road. He encourages them to, to, to look at the remedy, look at the antidote, to respond to this apostasy, and in this he reassures them. So we're going to end today reading from verse 32 to the end of the chapter. And I'm just going to kind of explain how he's now encouraging them. And then next week we will go verse by verse and really explain it. He begins at verse 32 with but. First before in verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is warned in verse 32, but, okay, so now we're back. Ah, oh, my brothers and sisters. Ah, oh, here you are, you know, but, okay. Call to remembrance the former days, okay? Everybody think about your former days. When you first came to know the Lord, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Look back at your former days when you came to know the Lord. Think back of what you were released from and what you came to and what that was like. Here he's giving them the, the antidote to apostasy, 
Remember, he says, you were born again. You were illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Recall have you how, how you have endured great affliction for that testimony. Okay, you've already been through some fire. He says, partly in verse 33, because you were made a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions. Partly the Jews around you were pointing fingers at you and mocking you for becoming a Christian. Partly because you had reproaches because of your faith. And partly because you became companions of people who have gone through the same thing. He says, you join the body, you join the church here and you're companions with other Jews converted who went through the same thing. And we could read the same thing about ourselves here. Read this about yourself now. Partly you endured affliction, my brothers and sisters here in the room in Salt Lake City, because you were made a gazing stock by reproach and afflictions by others. And I know people in this room, I know them personally who have each suffered reproaches because they have come to Christ. And partly, he says, you have suffered these afflictions because you have joined up with a band of other people who have suffered the same. And then he gives some specific examples from his general description given above, saying, for you had compassion on me in my bonds. I had trouble and you showed compassion to me and took joyfully, he says, the spoiling of your goods. You had some money. You, you, you joyfully uh, lost some of your goods, your household comforts, your luxury, whatever it was, uh, because you comforted me. Knowing, listen, in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He says, you have helped me in my bonds. You've given up, you sacrificed, you suffered affliction. You've done all of those things. Look back to those days, my brothers and sisters. Don't go into apostasy. Look to those days. And he says, and you did this. Why? Because by faith, you knew I've got a place there that trumps what's going on here. Hands down. Okay. That's what he's saying. You were willing to suffer for both me and my trials and afflictions. You spoiled your own goods, lost your own wealth and abundance in the process because you realize that in heaven, there's a far more enduring substance or, or wealth waiting for you. And having said this, he continues to encourage and direct them in the face saying, cast not away, therefore your confidence. Faith is to have confidence to boldly go. They were losing that. It was really tough then which has great recompense of reward, okay? Now he's talking about the good things on the other side for those who believe. Your confidence, trust me, when you die, you meet the loving God that has great recompense for reward for you. Here, the rewards aren't so great. Yeah, Rome is burning and yeah, it's gonna go down, but you will be saved, have confidence but look to the heavens above. Don't let go of your faith, your boldness in Christ to enter in through the veil called his flesh because of this confidence comes great reward. Then in verse 36, he gives some insight and advice about their current situation saying, you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You guys are still a little bit impatient. You're thinking of going back to your former lives. You need patience. And he says, he gives a promise, after you have done that will, then he says, you receive the promise. And in, in Hebrews chapter 11, he goes into this premise and he builds a whole chapter on it using individual people and talking about how they went forward, not having the promise, going forward, doing the will of God, but not knowing. And the whole chapter 11 is about that. And this is a preface to that verse 36. Be patient in your trials. I would, I would, I would counsel you as we depart today. Be patient in the trials you have. Have confidence in the fact that God has waiting for you a substance, a place, promises of the loving God you cannot comprehend. No matter how difficult, no matter how tired, no matter how burdened, no matter how much you get picked on, no matter how much you feel like you don't belong, no matter how much you die, you're failing in your flesh and you're sinning, all of those things do not let go of faith. Do not let go of him. And I promise you, the writer is saying, you will receive the promise. Be patient in the trials. It will pay off. God works this way. First, the trial. As we have seen trial through, the, done the will of God to his children, his sons and daughters receive the promises and they see them come to fruition. And then he reiterates the fact that the time was pressing near for the Lord's return. Listen to what he says. For yet a little while, he didn't mean 2,000 years, my friends. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. They expected it and anticipated it and will not delay, will not tarry. 
okay? I'm promising you, hang on through these persecutions. He will come and not delay, Scripture says. And after having encouraged them to remember where they came from and all that they have suffered, their need for patience, and that they need to wait on the Lord because he will come as he has promised, he reiterates saying, now the just, the justified shall live by faith. There's the whole point, by faith. But, there's that but, and here's the if. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Listen now how he describes drawing back here. But we are not of them, he encourages now again, we are not of them that draw back into perdition, he says. That's hell, that place of perdition, not the lake of fire. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul, the mind, will, and emotion. That is what it says. 